It appears Joseph Duncan was on the prowl for victims for several weeks before he brutally attacked Brenda and Slade Groney and Mark McKenzie. Duncan used a GPS system to mark points of interest as he traveled from his home in Fargo, North Dakota, through Missouri, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, and into Spokane. FBI agents found that GPS in Duncan's Jeep, then used that information to visit those marks. One mark put Duncan 25 miles north of Casper, Wyoming, at a rock outcropping. A message handwritten on a rock reads, quote, Deep in my dungeon, I welcome you here. Signed with the numbers 36623, Duncan's inmate number while serving a prison sentence in Washington. Between Fargo and Montana, seven homes, including a daycare, were all within several feet of marks in Duncan's GPS system. The homes were all rural, visible from a major highway, with play equipment in the yards. One of those homeowners testified today. Other marks in the GPS system put Duncan at three different locations in the Lolo National Forest, where we now know he held Dylan and Shasta captive for several weeks. Duncan's landlord and neighbor in Fargo also took the stand and testified about Duncan leaving his apartment trashed and messages scrawled on the wall. And a maintenance employee with Bighorn National Forest told jurors he found a trash can damaged by a 12-gauge shotgun, a gas station receipt with Duncan's name on it, and a receipt from the lion's den an adult superstore. I don't know that we have a good opener for this one. Well, I was going to say, for one, you want to talk about close to home. Very close to home. Also, probably one of the biggest things that happened, like, in the area. Yeah, and for that, like... I mean, there were, like, billboards. Right. And I guess we should... So, it's... 2005, right? Yeah. So, in 2005... Oh, I could tell them how I found out about it. I lived in Missoula. Oh, yeah. So, I'm I'm a senior in high school, and I don't know anybody in Missoula, because I moved there before my senior year, and I didn't give a fuck to meet people. I'm like... Right. Well, I, your boyfriend was over here. Yeah. Well, that, and I just didn't yeah. give a fuck. So, I'm sitting in this class they made all seniors take called Prep for Life. <laughs> And it was basically, like, a little bit of economics and a little bit of home ec and a fucking sex ed for, like, the fifth time in my life. You I'm like got way more sex ed than I did. I'm just like, yeah, thanks. I learned where the vast deference was, like, in seventh grade and tenth grade and now in twelfth grade. Like, I get it. STDs are bad. But so... This they tell you where the clitoris was located. I don't think so. Ah, maybe that's why men don't know where it is. They don't teach them. That's why they gotta watch porn. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> that was uh, a lot of anger in the yeah. sentence. I don't care. I'm just mm. saying, like, if we, you know, didn't mystify sex, yeah, and I don't know, it what, wouldn't be a problem. I don't know what else this class had. Like, we didn't like cook stuff, but it was kind of like. The idea behind, like, recipes and all that shit. Whatever. But so I had to sit there through this fucking class and I didn't care. And I'm sitting there one day, minding my own business, probably playing Snake on my phone because that's back when phones, like... Back when we all had Nokias? I had a flip phone, but it was not that okay. far past. Okay. I'm sitting there and these bitchy, you know, like the bitchy popular girls you want to hate... They're sitting in the back... Was it this phone specifically? Mm -hmm. I think I had this one shortly out of high school. Because I had this one before I had the pink razor. I may have had that one then. Okay. This artifact. Maybe. Yeah, the uh, mm -hmm. phones that don't even tell you what they are. So, I'm sitting there, though, and the, the popular chicks are like... They're always loud and talking about something. Mm -hmm. And I hear one of them say, Oh my god, did you hear about all those people in Coeur d'Alene that got slayed and killed and stuff? And I'm just sitting there like, Excuse me, what the fuck? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, beg pardon? And because it happened in May, so that was, like, towards yeah. the end of the school right. year. And I'm just sitting there like, huh? So then I get home because, you know, our cell phones didn't internet back then. Right. Children. And, yeah, I go on the computer. We had, you know, a DSL line. Oh, you were fancy. We didn't have that dial up anymore, but we, you know, I don't even know if, I don't know. And I look it up and I'm just like, what the fuck? And at the time it was literally like, Three family members murdered, two kids missing, and that was basically right. it. 
And then since my boyfriend and all my friends were over here, I drove between Missoula and here like every other weekend probably. And then the billboards and the signs and the Amber Alerts and Mm -hmm. the whole way, like all those signs that say, watch for ice or don't text and drive. It was literally, if you see Shasta and Dylan, call the fucking police. Like everywhere. Right. Yeah, there were pictures everywhere. All the things. Because a dirtbag named Joseph Edward Duncan III was born. In 1963. Yeah, in Tacoma, Washington, because... He's exactly a year older than my dad. Ew, nice. Same birthday? Yep. Nice. <laughs> See, your dad's done pretty good for himself, comparing contrastedly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. how I feel when I look at Renfro. I'm like, oh, I'm older. I'm older than you. you yeah. You've made bad choices, child. His brother, Bruce... Because uh, uh, Joseph is the uh, second youngest, the fourth of five children. Okay. Born to Lillian May and Joseph Edward Duncan Jr., because he's okay. the third. The third. His brother Bruce said that they were normal children of an army family while growing up. We moved every year or two. We traveled quite a bit until Dad retired in Tacoma. We went to school. We went to church. We were members of Boy Scouts. We were typical teenagers. His parents got divorced when he was 16. He told prison therapists that he'd suffered incest and other abuse at home and had molested numerous children before he was caught. Ugh. <laughs> His sister, Sherry, I'm assuming not Cherry. Cherry would be weird. She testified, yeah, what Sherry. It, she testified what it was like growing up with Duncan in their childhood home and said that she and her four siblings were frequently beaten by their mother and told that they men were worthless and she described her mother as a crazy woman who attended church obsessively. Hmm. Huh. Uh, Bruce denies all of this, saying he was there too and never witnessed any abuse or anything. So it's kind of one of those I don't really know what happened scenarios. He said, he said, she said? Basically. Okay. Like, were you abused or not? And I even looked on Joseph's blog trying to find more. Well, when you say blog, he was writing to someone and someone was posting his yes. writings. Because well, he when had you're a, on death, did he, he have, have a, a blog He before? had a blog before. But I think everything on the one that's there now is his prison okay. blog. But I was just like, maybe there's like a little tidbit about, you know, no, I couldn't find anything. So, okay. potentially abused? I mean, it would, I hate to say it, but without therapy and intervention. Right. The abused become the abusers. It, right. So, I mean, it. it's possible. It makes sense. I'm not going to say it didn't happen or that it did, but and it's possible. And considering his earliest crimes and stuff have been sex crimes against boys. He was, like, confused about his sexuality and if his mom thought men were garbage, which I mean, that's probably perfectly true. Maybe she didn't beat them, but I mean, her mom, if they got, if they, I guess she got divorced, she might hate men. Yeah, maybe. So if it you happens. are a gay man and your mom is like, men fucking suck, I mean, you're not gonna tell your mom you're into boys. Right. And also, no, no. what was this, like, the... 70s? I feel like you didn't tell people you liked boys when you were a boy in the 70s at all. No. No. So. Which I feel like may have in and of itself created some problems for people. Right. His brother saw him a few times in prison because, you know, he was imprisoned earlier. Okay. Before. Before the, the prison sentence that never ends. He got out, he met him in Seattle, and they hung out a few times and saw each other on the holidays, but, you know, nah, didn't really click. And, uh, you know, two decades in prison will change you. Well, and some siblings, like, I don't want to sound shitty, but, like, some siblings really just aren't that close. Yeah. I mean... Well, and Bruce is older than him, so, right. you know, you're talking about your younger brother you're probably not that close with. Right. Who... Well, and I don't know the birth order, but if... You know, Bruce could potentially be 10 or 15 years older. Right. And, and I want to say, I don't know, it doesn't sound like they're super close, because any article where I think Sherry and Bruce are the only ones that have talked to media, mm-hmm. really, about yeah. it. The other siblings and stuff are kind of like, <laughs> I don't want anything to no, do with that please, train wreck. Please leave me alone. Mm-hmm. So he got incarcerated when he was younger, because we'll, we'll hear it in a minute. He, boys. But his, uh, his brother said, you take a teenager who's confused about his sexuality and committed a horrific crime that is inexcusable even for a child, and you throw him in a prison with a bunch of murderers and rapists, 
He was 100 pounds soaking wet and became the target of other prisoners looking for sex. And I want to say that's like when he was still in his teens. He would have been 17 or 18. So, I mean, he started getting... I mean, yeah. Prison touched early. But his his first crime was in 1978 when he was... Oh my god, I could have just 15 two years later. Fuck. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, he committed his first known sex crime, raping a nine-year-old boy at gunpoint. Spoiler, he has a long history as a violent sexual predator. Now, as we carry on, here's where I have the problem. At 15, he raped someone at gunpoint. Like, <laughs> normal 15-year-olds? Uh-huh. I mean, I do think there had to have been some sort of trauma in his past. Because normal 15-year-olds, that's not what we do. Well, and, I mean, if a normal 15-year-old were to sexually assault somebody younger, usually it's not a gunpoint. <laughs> no, and usually it's not... Okay, I don't want people to take this that I'm making excuses, because I'm absolutely not making excuses, right. and it's not okay to victimize people. A lot of people from... 12 to 15 are and if his family was religious he probably was sexually repressed and exploring Uh wasn't an option right and a lot of like at that those ages it's more out of curiosity than out of viciousness but i would say doing raping a 15 raping a nine-year-old at gunpoint at 15 is obviously vicious that takes it like to the next level right and like why I mean, he was a child, like, I, at a time, worked for the juvenile courts. Like, I understand that we handle juveniles differently than we handle adults. Um, I think nowadays there would have been a lot more, what happened to you? (laughs) Right. That made you this, made you, I don't want to say made you this way, but. Well, like. There has to be something, like, I don't think that people are just inherently evil. Like, there had to have been something done right. to him that or that I don't want to say that he saw but mm-hmm. that's just that's not normal behavior for a 15 year old well, under like, any circumstance. Spoiler alert he died of a glioblastoma tumor in his brain that he got it operated on at one point which I'm not really a big fan of um, death row inmates getting $100,000 brain surgeries. Yeah. I'm just saying. I, I like the death penalty when people are dirtbags. Did we just have a noise? I don't know. Anyway. It was probably something outside. Probably. But the like, weather's weird today. The ones where you're like beyond the beyond a reasonable mm-hmm. doubt. And like Duncan admitted to it. There right. was no doubt. Like people knew. There was a living <laughs> witness slash victim. Right. right. Like I have no issue with them being executed and I wish it happened faster. Yeah. Because like you know, Jonathan Renfro is well, and like I, 31 and he got a death sentence when he was, how many years ago was that? 15? Well, the case started in 2015. I don't think he was, I think it was 2017 or 20, I think it was, we'd have to look. Anyway, he was like 28 or 20, 27 right. to 29. Gets a death sentence. Like, when do you think Idaho will execute him? I mean, <laughs> conservative, I mean... I would say 50 at the earliest. Right. Which, I mean, you get appeals, you get all that shit, but why the fuck? Well, and here's the problem I have with the appeals on the death penalty. I understand appeals in certain cases, Mm -hmm. but there's other cases where it's like, no, this was open and shut. There's no reason to be appealing this other than that I feel like some and I'm fairly pro I'm I'm pro death penalty when we know for sure who did the crime um I don't think that we should just put everyone to death I don't think well I don't think the way the death penalty is done in our country serves as a deterrent because it takes 30 years right and they're not I mean they're somewhat public but I think for a death penalty to be an effective like, deterrent. It hey, needs to be if you right commit, away and... If you commit crimes, we're going right. to kill you, but, you know, you're going to get to live in solitary confinement for 30 years first. Right. And, like, on Joseph Duncan's blog, I mean, he'd been in... What, did he go into federal prison in 2007? 
Yeah. So, I mean, on his blog, he has a couple posts where he talked about, like, the day in the life of a death row inmate. And it's pretty fucking chill. Mm-hmm. He has a TV in yeah. his room. And, you know, like, so if you watched Orange is the New Black, because that's the show with the prisons that I watched mm-hmm. the most of. I watched a lot of Oz, but... um. You know, they, like, Same thing. use weird stuff to, like, boil water and mm-hmm. all that. Mm-hmm. So he talks about how he would use, somehow with the TV and the electricity and tweezers, to make a water boiler to cook stuff in his cell. And, like, the other inmates would do this. And, like, he buys the tweezers with the commissary. Mm-hmm. We have a cat being crazy. Something. I'm jumpy because we're talking about I know. death row well, inmates. Keep talking. I'll, and <laughs> I just got to make sure your cat didn't like eat my laundry basket over or something. Yep, your cat yeeted my laundry basket. Did Tuli want in the basket? Um, or it fell. It could have fallen. It might have just fallen. Yeah. There's a ghost in that part of my trailer. I don't think this is mine. But <laughs> no, this is a skirt, and I have not worn a skirt in ages. So okay. Okay. I do think the ghost needed my laundry basket, though. Yeah. Wouldn't be the first time something got yeeted by the ghost off of the laundry. Okay, well, back to the subject at hand. Now that I'm horrified. But, like... We're fine. Ghosts don't have bodies. They can't hurt us. Right. So, yeah. He, uh, well, apparently, like, he kind of had, like, a porn stash, if you will, when he was on trial. Mm-hmm. And once he was in prison, he only ever shaved, like, he didn't shave until 2019. Oh, God. Like, I think he just kind of trimmed the beardage. And then, um, all the time he was in prison, he went outside three times, because they could do rec inside or outside. Outside was, like, in, you know, like, the cage. Right. Um, and he said you couldn't even really see that much of the sky, so he didn't like it. He well, spent, what's the point? He spent his rec time since he had good behavior. Mm-hmm. He was allowed to have rec with this guy named Steve. And they would play chess and stuff. Okay. Oh, and Joseph Duncan crocheted. And he was allowed to buy yarn, because you could, like, there's a normal commissary, mm-hmm. and then if you're good, you can order special stuff. Okay. So, okay, but here's the thing. Like, there's things I have in common with serial killers. Yeah. Me and Ted Bundy were both Mormons. <laughs> Me and Joseph Duncan both crochet, I guess. Yeah. He's a serial... Would he be a serial killer or like a... Duncan? Duncan's a serial killer because he killed other people. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I couldn't decide if he is a rampage killer or a serial killer. Or is he categorized as both? I think he's just a shithead. But... Well, yeah. So it's just like... Obviously, you're going to make the best out of a bad situation, maybe. Maybe. I mean, some people in prison are just fuckwads. Yeah. But I'm like, okay, so had he not died a couple weeks ago of a giant tumor in his brain hole? Well, and here's the ironic part. Like, I think we can still only execute healthy people, so as soon as they found out he had cancer, they weren't going to be able to execute him anyway. Right, and now that Biden is president, they're not going to execute anybody. Well, the feds aren't going to execute anyone. So... Did he commit any of his crimes in Texas? I mean, he's already dead, so it doesn't no. matter. But theoretically Washington, speaking. California, Idaho, and everybody except... Well, everybody gave him life sentences except the feds, but if the feds didn't give him the death penalty... Idaho wanted him back. Idaho wanted to borrow him back for a special hearing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I am glad that I live in a state that does at least... Right. ...scare people with the death penalty. But I'm just saying, like, he had it... It seemed like... He adapted. He'd been in prison right. before, but he was cozy. Right. It's not yeah. a deterrent that, like, if no. you're familiar, you're not going to go probably on death row having never been to jail before. That's true. I mean, that'd be an interesting statistic to look. It up. would be. But like, should you're, we get back to his story? Though? Yeah. I'm just saying, you're probably not going to be that person. Right. If you're not that person. So he commits his first violent sex crime at 15. <laughs> 15. Which, quite frankly, like, I wish we still, like, could hospitalize. Like, I really think either he was severely abused or he had severe mental illness or both. Oh, my whole point was going to be that the brain tumor probably wasn't affecting him way back then. You don't (laughs) think the brain tumor was affecting him in 78? Probably not. Probably not. Okay. It may have been in 2005. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so, yeah. Gets a gun and... Rapes a nine-year-old at gunpoint in Tacoma. The following year, he got arrested for stealing a car. 
And so uh, I don't think I'm assuming he wasn't ever tried for the 15 year old. I don't one. think so. I think he admitted that this later. Must have come out later. Yeah. Okay. Um, he was sent to Dis- Diceland's, Diceland's Boys, Ranch. Boys Ranch, Tacoma, where he told a therapist that he had bound and assaulted six boys. Okay. He also told the therapist that he had estimated that he raped 13 younger boys by the time he was 16. So I think the the binding or and sexually assaulting mm-hmm. was like at the boys ranch. Oh. Okay. And then the 13 younger boys by the time he was 16 was like total. Okay. So 2 years later, <laughs> when he was 17, he stole a number of guns from a neighbor and then abducted a 14-year-old boy and sodomized him at gunpoint. Ugh. He got sentenced to 20 years in prison and got released in 1994 after 14 years. <sighs> He's well, and here's the thing, like, that's actually, like, a pretty hefty mm-hmm. sentence for, I mean, even, sorry people, but as much as we think, and I agree, I think these people should be locked up for life. I don't think necessarily that you can fix them. Right. But it's not like, I've seen cases where people are given, like, a slap on the wrist. Right. Six months in jail. Well, and I don't want to sound terrible, but if it had happened to a woman in 1980, he probably wouldn't have been sentenced to 20 years. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying. Well, at the time, they were probably like, oh, he's got those homosexual tendencies. Mm -hmm. Like, we have to lock him up. Right. Which, I mean, I'm sure when he was a child, if his tendencies were showing and he'd been allowed to, you know, learn that maybe he was different than the other boys well, at school that liked girls. Maybe he wouldn't have been a total dirtbag. Maybe. He lived all over Seattle while out on mm-hmm. parole and then he was arrested in 96 for marijuana use because Washington didn't like the weed yet. Well, um, and I think some of that's because he was still on parole. Well, yeah. Um... During his parole, he probably, they believe, he murdered Sammy Joe White and Carmen Cubias in Seattle in 96. And uh, so at the time, they believed he murdered Anthony Martinez in Riverside County, Mm -hmm. California in 97. Spoiler, California borrowed him from the feds Mm -hmm. and convicted him. Mm -hmm. Um, But so back at the time, both of those cases were cold cases and weren't tied to Duncan until after he was arrested in... His most famous killing mm-hmm. of the Groney family. Mm-hmm. He ends up in Kansas. 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 And arrested. Because uh, he, he's violating parole. Because uh, apparently they don't know where the fuck he is if he's... Right. Killing people in California and in Kansas. Um, doesn't say what month, but he was arre- He was released... In July of 2000, with time off for good behavior. Well, and here's the thing, like, there's some people that, like, function really well under the structure of incarceration. Right. Like, he probably does just fine when Uh he's told what to do and where to go and when he can eat. And so, yeah, he probably, I mean, I think there's a lot of people that are really horrible humans, but function in prison. Well, and... And behave themselves in prison. Also, if he's battling with his sexuality, he's probably able to explore that in prison a little more. Oh, God, you're probably right. I know. Don't, I don't want to. But, well, you know. So he gets, each their own. Yeah. <laughs> prison sex doesn't sound fun across either border for me. I don't want to have to poop in front of people either. So the whole thing yeah, is just I mean, of, there's so many deterrents to keep me from going to prison, right. personally. I'm like, mm, kill people? Shit in front of humans. Ah, I'd rather not. <laughs> so he goes to Fargo, North Dakota. For fun? Why? I don't know. Ew. Maybe because he'd been raping people in all the other states. He's like, I need to go a little farther away. And, I mean, I'm assuming that he probably committed some more crimes in Kansas and North Dakota and stuff. Just didn't get caught. Mm -hmm. It's like, why, you know? Well, yeah. I mean... Obviously, if you look at the whole timeline, he was never deterred. No. Or given treatment for these choices. I don't know, once you're an adult, how much treatment can actually be done. Well, so, once he... After he goes to North Dakota, like, he's pretty much gonna... Go down the path that 
leads to his demise as Sally throws fucking screwdrivers at me. I'll stop. Uh, I can't reach it now. We're safe. Okay. So Sally's fidgety, guys. <laughs> I gotta have something to fiddle with. <laughs> July 3rd, 2004. He's charged with the molestation of two boys at a playground. Since it's a playground, I'm going to assume they're uh, minors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. On April 5th, 2005, just in case you're wondering, we're like T-minus 30 days Yeah. Yep. He appeared before a judge and set his bail at $15,000. Somebody he knew posted his bail, and then, you know, he fucking dipped. This is why you don't... This is a tangent. This is why you don't post bail for people. Uh-huh. Unless they're, like, spouse, child, sibling. Oh, I would not post bail for a sibling. Well, okay. Um, Spouse, child? It would depend on what they did. Yeah, well. I mean, really, like... I would really well, depend on what they did. There's anyway. a big difference between, like, weed or a DUI versus... Well, yeah, I mean, a 300... Like, if molesting I... Molesting children. Post a $300 bond for someone getting arrested for possessing marijuana. Like, if I don't get my 300 bucks back, it's not the end of the world. And then you're just like, dumbass, hide your weed. Right. You know. So, he disappears. Maybe not have your car smell like a... giant... Dispensary? Right. Joint. Uh, something. Mm. Yeah. So, they, they're they pretty sure before he had skipped bail, he had been planning to travel because, you know, after they investigate all this shit, he went to Walmart and bought night vision goggles and a video camera. No. Then he rented a red 2005 Jeep Grand Cherokee on April 15th, which he traveled through parts of Missouri. Like, if you draw his path on a map, you're like, what the fuck? Kansas... Did, D- d- well, like, Detroit, like Michigan, Fargo, Minnesota, well, yeah, Missouri. Minnesota. Okay. Like, bro, are you drawing a pentagram on the map with a car? <laughs> <laughs> on April 27th, he stole a set of license plates from another vehicle in Missouri because if you're going to steal a car, you know, right. change the plates, duh. Because uh-huh. you know, police have cameras that take uh-huh. pictures and whatever. I'm not encouraging it. I'm just Did saying. they in 2005, though? I mean, probably not. I'm just saying now. Right, yeah. If you're going to steal a car, yeah. Don't. Don't do it. It's not wise. (laughs) It's not worth it, people. And then on May 4th, the Jeep was reported stolen. So on June 1st, a federal warrant was issued for him because he didn't, you know... Didn't show up in Minnesota. He jumped bail. Mm Mm-hmm. And I want to say that, you know, federal warrant, it was like full 50 state extradition. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. fuck you. Because he molested children on a playground. Right. Yeah. At that point, he had taken Interstate 90 either through South Dakota or up through Wyoming, which Interstate 90 doesn't go through Wyoming. Mm, South Dakota, no, Montana. Well, I think 90, 25 goes up and hits 90, but I don't, right. I thought 90 didn't, I thought 90 was in Mon- Southern Montana. I didn't think 90 hit Wyoming. I don't I'm think it does. Them, I know. 90 does dip down through Sheridan and Buffalo. Okay. And then 25 goes down. Okay. To Cheyenne and Denver, and then 80. So does 90 split? Because you can drive all the way across Montana. I wonder... Now I'm going to have to look at it. I know. U.S. You know what? Fuck it. Do it on the big screen, please. Pause. Google Maps. I think it just dips. But I've driven all the way across Montana, and I thought we were on 90 the whole time. No, we weren't. Okay. No, it dips. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So maybe they were saying Wyoming or South Dakota because they weren't sure if he stayed on 90 the right. whole time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, now that we've solved that highway mystery. Well, he couldn't have gone through South Dakota or Wyoming. I mean. He, he probably went through both. Right. Unless he. Unless he went all the way down to Nebraska highway. to Wyoming. Anyway, I don't like the I way they worded it. It was weird. It's not important. <laughs> no, not really. The important part is that he fucking ended up here. <laughs> yes, he did. How far is that from where we're sitting right now? Fuck it. Um, so the uh, most direct route is 17.7 miles from where we're sitting right now. So hashtag close to home. Yes. Uh, ha He stopped at the Wolf Lodge area approximately eight miles west of Coeur d'Alene for unspecified reasons. Maybe he was tired. Maybe he had to poop. Who knows? Who knows? 
Well, okay, keep going. I'm not going to say that yet. I was going to say it. That's a big one. Um, I think to do... Oh, I, it repeats itself because I'm an idiot. Oh, okay. That's fine. So do you want me to read this part? Um, so you can substitute the word neighborhood because it's clearly not a neighborhood. Yeah, it's not a neighborhood. Ignore seven because I think eight is more... Yeah, it's more specific. Okay. So on May 16th, um, Idaho authorities discovered the bodies. No, this one. That one? Yeah. Okay. Of the Groney family, um, consisting of 40-year-old Brenda Groney, her 37-year-old boyfriend, Mark McKenzie, and Brenda's three children, 13-year-old Slade, 9-year-old Dylan, and 8-year-old Shasta. Also, those were not, those were the people that lived at the house. Right. She had other children. <laughs> which we will not talk. Well, we can, we can get there. <sighs> Vance. Vance and... What's his name? Anyway. I want to say he was, like, staying at the campground, and then that's why, like, he had the night vision goggles and then was, like, watching them Yeah, and for stuff. some reason I thought he was across the highway, but... He may have been over there, too. Um, He's fucking winner. So, becoming interested in Dylan and Shasta, mind you, they're the nine and the eight-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, Duncan repeatedly returned to the name, well, the area... To secretly walk. I wonder if, I doubt he was paying to stay at the Wolf Lodge campground. Yeah. He was probably, because there are Forest Service campgrounds yeah. in the area. Like, I I really don't think he was staying at the Wolf Lodge yeah, campground. I, I mean, know. I still would never camp there, first of all, because it's by the freeway. But anyway. And it's probably fucking haunted. Yeah. Probably. Which usually makes me want to camp somewhere, but not when it happened, like, where I live. Right. It makes it different. Right. So... Apparently, he would watch the children from a safe vantage point using night vision goggles in the nighttime. He is also said to have stalked uh, the family for days as he prepared his attack. Um, on May 15th, the family drove to Coeur d'Alene to run errands before returning to celebrate a barbecue with others. Um, that went into the evening hours. Um, and I'm just going to say from living in this area, um, these people could throw a party, mm. is, I guess, what I'll say. So a lot there of people are, here can. Right, I lots mean, of people yeah. throw parties and drink heavily. Mm -hmm. Um, so, if you're, you know, if you're a creepy serial killer and you've been stalking a family and you know the parents are intoxicated, I'm assuming this would be prime time to attack. So... Try to abduct children yes. you've been watching? Right. Because, yes. So, according to the spokesman review, um, the 13-year-old boy had been hired to mow the grass by his driveway, or by a neighbor's driveway. And there are some houses out there, like, it's a pretty rural area, but there are, like, there's houses nearby. Um, it's so, not a neighborhood, but... Right. There's people. So the neighbor didn't have the money to pay him, but promised he would stop by the house to pay the money. Oh, I feel bad for this poor neighbor. Right? Well, I mean, hopefully the neighbor didn't go in the house. Um, we'll read the story. <laughs> when the neighbor arrived at the Groney home on May 16th to pay Slade for, you know, mowing the grass, mm -hmm. he found that no one was apparently home. A dog was barking incessantly from inside. The family... Well, okay, now here's another thing. You know someone is crazy if they're willing to go in a house with a dog. Barking. Like, that is enough to deter, like, most, like, yeah. most criminals don't want to deal with your dog. And Well, and for all we know, like, maybe, you know, he was going to go in and, like, sneak the kids or something. Right. And the dog woke up right. Mark. Probably. Who was like, what the fuck are you doing in here? Get the fuck out. Well... He looked fucking creepy back then, too. Like. Right. Well, and here's the other thing. Like, Slade was not small. No. Um, like, he was not a small boy. Right. So, I'm sure there was, anyway, quite the fight inside the house. Right. So, the dog was barking. The family cars were still parked in the driveway, but with the doors, the car doors were open. So, I mean, me as a neighbor, like, especially if this fam, like... If they've lived there for a while, like, you know this isn't normal behavior. Yeah. So, the neighbor, like, I would have called 911. I'd been like, um, something weird's going on. Right. I don't know that I want to go into how they were found dead. 
We'll just leave it that... So Brenda, the boyfriend, and the 13-year-old were found dead in the house. Um, there was no sign of Dylan or Shasta. Um, I the mean, deputies, I mean, I feel like... We'll just, we'll just say it. He beamed him with a hammer. Okay. He, there you go. See, Diana's grosser than I, I am. I don't want to think about it. It grosses me out. If you get to gross things, just let me know. <laughs> okay, so I think, like, the... Well, the man who was our sheriff before the current sheriff... What the fuck was it? Was Wolfinger. So oh, Wolfinger Oh, like was, literally. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I was trying to go before that. Sheriff Wolfinger was the sheriff's office's press guy when all this happened, which I'm pretty sure is why he became sheriff. Yeah. And I do think that this investigation, like, I will give the law enforcement the props that, like, they did a good job. So I'm trying to, like, find exactly. Because I know there's an article that says he was here when he whatever. Right. Um, how much do you think it costs the county for this case? I don't even want to know. Like hundreds of thousands. Like of dollars. investigation through millions. Five hundred and seventy-three thousand dollars. Yeah, it's a major chunk of the county's entire budget. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and especially you know, sixteen years ago yep. when the county was much smaller, and you know, mm. working people could afford houses. Mm. <laughs> I digress. <laughs> I'm never gonna own a home unless someone dies and leaves me one. Unless the fucking economy collapses here. <sighs> yeah, that's true, and I'll still have a job, so it's fine. Mm-hmm. Anyways, so they start a search for Dylan and Shasta because there's no no sign of them anywhere. Right. <laughs> Three dead, two gonzo. Like, yeah, huh? Something is amiss. Well, and I think there were a lot of people at this time who thought that it had potentially been some sort of drug deal gone bad, and that these were people, like, someone knew these people that took the, like... Yeah. I mean, you in kidnappings, like, and stuff, you always look to family and relations, well, and... But and, there was a lot of public, yeah. like, well, you know... Because, like you said... Like, with the, you know, kill all the pedos mentality, mm-hmm. most of them were family. Mm-hmm. Like, you're going to assume somebody they knew committed right. a crime. It wasn't right. some fucking rando. Right. That drove up from Missouri in a stolen vehicle. Yeah. Like, so I work in a place where we may or may not have court files, and I may or may not scan them, and I may or may not have done this Dirtbags Files recently. And the public document of the search warrant inventory... They took blood swabs from so many fucking Mm -hmm. places. Pages of swabs Mm -hmm. listed. Like, it wasn't pretty. No. Just look inside a small house and then, like... And it was, I mean... Imagine the... Just... Red. It was... I mean, I don't even know that it was a three-bedroom house. I think it was... Was it small? It It was little. I mean, maybe it had three bedrooms, but they were small. I think it had three bedrooms, but it was, like, less than a thousand square feet. Yeah, it was a small, small, Mm -hmm. small, old house. Um, So, apparently, they found someone else as a suspect. Oh, the... (laughs) And I think this is kind of where some of the... It's a local... 33-year-old concrete Bob. Concrete Bob. (laughs) Why? Because he... Worked in the construction and concrete industry. Hence the nickname Concrete Hey, I need Bob. my driveway refinished. Why don't you call Concrete Bob? Yeah, call Concrete Bob. Okay. Oh, fuck. So, he had a lengthy criminal record. Um, who was believed to have visited the family on the day of the murders just hours before. A relative of his told investigators that Concrete Bob owed Brenda and Mark $2,000. So, police searched for him. He took a polygraph, um, which apparently he was truthful in his polygraph. During the search, the FBI and other agencies joined in. They, it looks like the FBI offered a $100,000 reward. So, at the time, were polygraphs, like, definitive, well, admissible, like... I don't think they're, I mean, I don't think they've been admissible in court for a long time. But I think law enforcement uses them as a tool in that if you're not being deceptive, they trust that, okay, you're not being deceptive and, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And here's the thing, like, 
it, it's one thing to have like a criminal past for you know driving without a license and getting DUIs and getting in bar fights. Um, Robert Luther in early 2005 got an aggravated battery charge. He, okay. has, he has a lengthy criminal history. A right. lot of it, a lot of it's after that. Right. But he got sued <laughs> for an injury. Well, he claim. probably owed someone two thousand dollars. I mean, he's apparently committed crimes in like every fucking county in Idaho. Well, some criminals mm, get around. Misdemeanor, misdemeanor, don't care. <laughs> Is it wrong that that's where I'm at in life? No. Let's... I'm like, what's your criminal history? Oh, misdemeanors. I don't give a shit. He really didn't have that much of a criminal history back then. <laughs> In Idaho, anyway. Yeah. So, um, let's see. On May 19th, investigators received a tip from a sporting goods store owner. There's a sporting goods store in Bonner's Ferry? (laughs) Apparently. Okay. About a man asking for directions to Libby, Montana. I didn't know they had electricity in Bonner's Ferry. Bonner's Ferry is an interesting place. So anyway, so the man was asking, there's only, like, you take Highway 2. That's Mm -hmm. how you get to Libby from Bonner's Ferry. Like, there's roads, take the one that goes that way. Uh, Yeah, there's a sign. (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) How do I get there? Read the sign, dumbass. So, the man was asking for directions to Libby, Montana, driving a white van with Washington license plates and accompanied by two children who fit... Dylan and Shasta's physical descriptions. Though the roads leading from Bonner's Ferry to Libby were searched, no sign of the van was found. Do we know if there was a van? He was in a... He was in the 2005 Jeep Grand Cherokee. Okay, so he's still... So there was no van. No. So this guy... It's probably not him. Someone saw two kids, a boy and a girl, about the right age. Yeah. And I mean, we should mention that, like, Dylan and Shasta... I'm not... I'm not saying this to be mean, but they were regular looking white kids. They right. were there was nothing super They were eight and nine right. year old. They were white eight and nine year old white kids. Like also, I mean there's like a far north outfitters. And okay, stuff. fine. So by sporting goods they probably mean like fishing shit. In a basketball. So meanwhile, the investigators were looking at possible motives. I kinda talked about this earlier. Right. Drug deal got bad because marijuana and meth were in Brent Denmark's bloodstream. Okay, let's be real. Imagine, like, the majority of the population of Kootenai County died, mm-hmm. and they tested their bodies. How many do you think would there have would marijuana be a lot, and or well, meth in their bloodstream? There would like, be a lot with marijuana, for sure, yeah. and a good deal. I mean, especially, I mean, meth was really a problem in 2005. That's when we had the billboards, wasn't it? Yeah. It was, like, the I mid-2000s, so. yeah. we had those, like, meth not even once billboards yeah. with, like, the girl that was obviously being... Used well, for sex in exchange for meth right, and, like, scabby. Right. Like. Well, and then here's the other, like, I know that, so not Mark, who was the boyfriend, but the ex-husband was in a motorcycle club. What year are we discussing? Like, now, I mean, I think he's been in a motorcycle club for, yeah. I mean, he's since passed away, too, but. And the, what, I 2008 think, to 10, I would have talked to him at work because I worked at a Harley store. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, he was, yeah. He's anyway. a pretty nice guy, really. And I, I mean, don't know that the the club that he's in, I don't know that they're actually... Like, I, he's not a member of the Hells Angels. Right. Was, I don't remember what it was, but... Did I ever tell you a Hells Angel came in and talked to me once and it was a little weird? They're like... They have an atmosphere about mm-hmm, them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm, like, selling him a t-shirt well, when I'm 20. <laughs> yeah, well, and you know what's funny? If you go to Spokane, the Hells Angels Clubhouse is right next to the UGM Women's and Children's. Like, I think that they, like, funded it. Like, I'm not mm-hmm. even gonna lie. I think that yeah. they funded the... Well, and here's the thing. If you're an abusive asshole... And you figure out that your wife is staying at this shelter and the Hells Angels Clubhouse is next door. You're going to think twice before you try to go there, too. You know. Well, the thing with, like, when I worked, because I worked at the a Harley dealership for, like, two and a half years. Like, you have these bikers that, you know, they're like, oh, Hells Angels are, well, they're scary. Like, yeah, they have done shit. The guy I talked to very well could have killed people. But, like, right. as long as you're not a fucking criminal. Right. Like, yes, they break the law, but it's, like, almost not justified, but, like, well for justice. And a lot of, like, I mean, they're involved in drug trafficking and whatever. And maybe some guns. Right. 
Right. My favorite thing. And interesting sexual practices. My, my favorite thing in Sons of Anarchy was when Clay would yell about pussy. <laughs> yeah, Clay's pussy serpent was about the best part. I mean, like, I love the whole series, Sons of Anarchy. I would, I watch it all the time. Still, don't judge me. It's um, just brought me love. So, like, I think there was, like, real thought that this could be... Yeah. Some, like, there could be some actual reason why... Right. ...this happened to this family. Not just some rando. Um, so, that was, like, in May... That they had the, you know, the Bonner's Ferry thing that I don't think was actually a thing. I'm assuming he stayed on 90. Yeah, because I know roughly where that campground area is. Yeah. And you would have taken 90, exited in. Okay. Yeah. Is it near St. Regis? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's, like, have you actually driven around St. Regis? So you get off the freeway. So we've gone, if you go from Avery up the St. Joe River, mm -hmm. you can dump out in St. Regis. Yeah. So, but I've never, like, really explored the other side of the freeway from St. Regis. So the I-90 exit, if you're going east, you get off. And then if you go straight, there's, like, town. Mm -hmm. If you turn left, there's, like, the big travel center that has the trout aquarium right, right, and stuff. Yeah. My favorite thing in the world, by it's the way, is pretty that I fly in awesome. that thing every time I go there. Yeah, I know. Every time. I don't even care how many times I've seen the trout. I, I don't think we've even been there together, but I have to climb in that little thing I have every to time. see the trout. They're awesome. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, like, if you turn and drive past that, there's not very much town. It's, like, a very small town, and then you're in the fucking woods. Right. If you go straight, that's the highway. You can end up, like, up in Glacier and shit. Mm -hmm. But if you turn off anywhere, you're in the fucking woods. Right. If you go the other way, guess what? You're in the fucking woods. Yeah. And Montana has a lot of natural space and a lot yes. of places you can camp and... No one would know you were there. Like, quite frankly, <laughs> if you would like to disappear, Montana's not a bad choice. <laughs> no, not really. Um, so, apparently the investigation goes cold. Um, I feel like I rem like... I feel like there was, like, security camera footage from somewhere that showed him and her, like... Or Duncan and Shasta in, like, a gas station somewhere. And I want to say it was Moscow, but that feels wrong. Yeah. At 1.30 p.m. on July 2nd. So this is, like, and even back then, like, the 4th of July in Coeur d'Alene was a big deal. Oh, yeah. Like, big, big deal. So on the 2nd of July, so 42 days after the case began, um, Joseph Duncan and Shasta were spotted <laughs> in the Coeur d'Alene Denny's. By two, um, by two young men smoking cigarettes. So one of the girls I went to beauty school with supposedly was there. Her and, I think it was two brothers and her and this other girl were dating them. Um, anyway, they were there. Um, so I don't know if they were the ones who called or not. I never really, but I anyway. think a few people called. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, probably. Because if you were around here, like, I even, I lived in Missoula until October well, there of 2005. Like, like, there were billboards everywhere. You fucking knew that everywhere these kids were missing. Right. And at this point, you've probably seen the billboards enough where you would be like, that nondescript white girl looks like that right. missing one on the billboard. <laughs> yeah. Well, and here's the thing. Like, I think, I don't know that in 2005 I would have thought this, but now, like, if I... Like, I had seen that picture so many times and I saw her. Even if I wasn't 100% sure, I'm calling the cops because they can come figure that out. Like, yeah. I'm not going to let... Well, and the cops aren't going to get mad right. at you if it's not her. Right. They're going to be like, well, it wasn't, but it thanks for It did look like calling. her, but thanks for calling us. <laughs> I didn't know he placed her in the bathroom. Yeah, he, like, he knew people were calling and stuff because... Well, I mean, you would, I mean, you would notice. Right. Well, and, you know, because... Because every server in that place is back behind... I mean, yeah. I've been in that Denny's. Yeah. Um, I've been drunk in that Denny's. Uh, yeah, that's... Yeah. Mm, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the only time I've been in that Denny's. I've been drunk in that Denny's. Yeah. I don't think I've been in that Denny's sober now. Yeah. I, maybe, like, back when I was still Mormon, maybe I was in that Denny's sober having the sampler platter. <laughs> I've been in the post-world <sighs> Denny's sober having the sampler platter. 
Ladder. I will not go to the post office Denny's anymore since I got a raw chicken strip. Ew, that would do it. It was cold. So I took a bite and it was cold. And they brought our food out like really fast. Like I was like, what the hell? Oh. Like too fast. Yeah. I took it out of my mouth and it was like legit pink. Like I assumed chicken strips were pre-cooked. New? That one apparently was not. <laughs> I went to the, I'm like, Sean, I can't sit here and look at this pink chicken strip. Like, and of course that was the first thing I tried to eat. So my whole sampler platter went to waste. Yeah. Uh, why can't I be one of those regular people who eats French fries first? I don't anyway. know. So I go to the car and tell Sean to deal with it one way or another. I don't yeah. know if he paid for our meal that night or not. I have no clue. Don't care. I hope they didn't ask him to pay for it. Right. <laughs> yeah, I have. I don't know. I was like, you, like, and he was drunk too. This was back when we were irresponsible. <laughs> <laughs> he was our designated drunk driver. Mm. Anyway. There's so, always one. Yeah, I won't go to Post Falls Denny's. But anyway, yeah. back to the story at hand. <laughs> So, I'm assuming the cops got there quick. <laughs> yeah. Well, because like I said, I'm pretty sure more than one person called and was like, um... Well, yeah, because like, <laughs> I mean, people had cell phones at this point. So, yeah. I'm sure the guys who saw him like outside, if they were outside smoking, I'm sure they called. I'm sure as soon uh -huh. as he got into the restaurant with a child... Uh-huh. And I mean... He's skeezy, and then they'd been out in the wilderness, right. so it's not like he was clean and shaven no. and pretty. No. Like, you're like, oh, an eight-year-old girl with a fucking skeezy-looking dirty dude. Right. And I'm sure she wasn't, like, freshly showered and stuff either. Right. A lot of red flags. Yeah. So, the police show up, arrest him. They take, you know, Shasta to the hospital. Yeah. Um... Apparently, I mean, I guess, I mean, it says she was physically in good health. Mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine what she went through. Yeah. Um, I don't think mentally she was in good health. No. I don't think there's any way one could be. <laughs> no. And uh, now I'm going to say something awkward about how this is too long, so we're going to make a second part. 